tonight I'm going to be thinking actually with um, Ajamu Baraka, who is um, the one of the founders of the Black Alliance for Peace, and um, which is actually also having a forum tonight about people-centered human rights. And so I want to think of his think with his conceptual framework of people-centered human rights. Um, and a couple of articles that he wrote, one of which uh, was published in Jack Black Agenda Report, titled "Malcolm X and Human Rights in the Time in the Time of Trumpism." Transcending the Master's Tools, and then another that was titled, or that is titled The Human Rights Project, Determined by the Needs of the Powerful. And so in the first article, um, Baraka writes that Malcolm X operated in, in the tradition of earlier Black radical activists and intellectuals who in the late 1940s understood the subversive potential of the concept of human rights when it was diremted or, or sort of um, abstracted from the liberal, legalistic, and state-centered specifications um, that had that sort of dominate our understanding of human rights. Um, for Malcolm, internationalizing resistance to the system of racial oppression in the US meant redefining the struggle for constitutional civil rights by transforming the struggle for full recognition of African-American citizenship into a struggle for human rights. Um, and so, Mal, uh, Baraka talks about how Malcolm X studied three petitions, one coming from the National Negro Congress, one from the NAACP, and one from the Civil Rights Congress that were filed with um, the United Nations. And so I'm just going to spend a little bit of time talking about what those documents were and what happened to them. So the first petition was called um, a petition in, to the United Nations on behalf of 13 million oppressed Negro citizens of the United States. And this was filed with the United Nations in 1946. And essentially, essentially, it meant to highlight the anti-Black exploitation, oppression, and exclusion, um, which continued to plague the lives of African Americans in the form of discrimination and industrial and business employment, and the semi-feudal serfdom um, that was manifested in sharecropping and tenancy in the Deep South, um, and subpar or non-existent education for Black children, and the enforcement of um, living in, in crowded, uh, overcrowded slums and ghettos, and then the lynching and other modes of racial violence and terrorism against uh, Black people. They also talked about the disenfranchisement and the degrading and dehumanized, dehumanizing segregation to which Black people were subjected. And so they specifically called on the United Nations, um, particularly the UN Economic and Social Council, um, to endorse the petition and mobilize its influence to re redress the discrimination against African Americans who have petitioned the government time and again for redress of grievance with no result. And so in other words, they were saying that the US government was unresponsive to the plight of black people in the US. And so the United Nations um, needed to supersede the US government and, and act on behalf of black people. In 1947, the NAACP under the leadership of Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois filed uh, an appeal to the world, a statement of the denial of human rights to minorities in the case um, of citizens of Negro descent in the United States of America, and an appeal of the United Nations for redress. So that's a long title, mouthful. Um, so essentially this, this petition showed that the Negro problem or the condition of Blacks in the United States was foundationally not only economic, but it was also an international problem, one whose resolution required the intervention of the United Nations. Um, the United Nations needed to step in um, and use the very edge of their authority to protect the minority citizens in the United States, because this was not only in the interest of African Americans, but was in the interest of world peace and also foreigners who, um, if they had dark skin, were also at risk of being discriminated against, insulted, assaulted, and killed if they came to the United States. Um, this position presented a mountain of evidence um, that conveyed the failure of the US government to uphold the civil liberty, civil rights, and human rights of US Blacks. It also addressed the failure of the federal government to protect the rights and citizenship of African Americans, primarily by kowtowing to the doctrine of states' rights. So the federal, the federal government refused to act on behalf of African Americans, saying that they didn't have the power or jurisdiction because of states' rights. And as we know, states' rights is being employed at this very moment to deny any sort of comprehensive um, federal plan to protect uh, US citizens against the coronavirus that is specifically having a detrimental impact on um, racialized people. So again, this particular petition was showing that in order for, for um, African Americans to have their human rights respected, the UN was going to have to intervene. And that this was not only um, an issue for African Americans, but for the world at large, given the US hegemony um, and, and increasing US imperialism. 
So the third petition is called We Charge Genocide, the historic petition to the United Nations for relief from a crime um, of the United States government against the Negro people. And this what this is the the, rad the most radical of the three uh, documents because this was filed with the, the Genocide Commission and was not only a call for redress or was not primarily a call for redress, but was actually a call to like indict the US government and to hold the US government responsible for its violence against black people. It was a 240 page document prepared by the left wing civil rights Congress under the leadership of its National Executive Secretary, William L. Patterson. And it compiled even more evidence than um, an appeal to the world that documented more than 150 cases of murder or state sanctioned executions and more than 350 instances of beating, maiming, rape, or threats just between the year of 1945 and 1951. And even this was just a fraction of all of the violence against Black people that had occurred. Um, and it was, this was a collective document that was prepared by a multitude of people and signed by a number of um, doyens of the Black left, including W.B. Du Bois, uh, Charlotta Bass, Louis Burnham, Benjamin J. Davis, the Huntons, uh, W.L. Fias and Dorothy, Claudia Jones, Louis Thompson Patterson, and the Robesons. So it was like, you know, squad. They all signed it. And then even some uh, sort of liberal uh, liberals like Mary Church Terrell. Um, and so Patterson, in, in his uh, autobiography, The Man Who Cried Genocide, Patterson says essentially they prepared this document not only because the U.S. government was un, was unresponsive and was responsible for this crime of genocide, but also because they wanted to raise the consciousness of people within the United States that the struggle of African Americans was indeed an international struggle. He also thought that he wanted to raise um, to the world that what was happening to African Americans was just um, a step toward what was going to happen to the rest of the world. And then, of course, 1951 is when the U.S. entered into the Korean War. And so he made, so throughout the petition, there's all these connections made between the economic and political domination of Black people and then the war that's being waged in Korea. And the ways that all of this is predicated on this uh, racialized super exploitation. And the, the sort of radical nature of these petitions and the ways in which the U.S. was really adamant about not having the African-American issue become an international issue of human rights is manifested in the response to these um, to these petitions. So um, the National Negro Congress petition was basically swept under the rug by the U.S. delegation, um, the U.S. delegation at the United Nations, and it was prevented from coming under serious discussion. And that actually led to Du Bois by uh, uh, preparing an appeal to the world to, to revive the issue. And Eleanor Roosevelt, everybody's hero, did not want, you know, she worked very hard to not have an appeal to the world um, heard in the United Nations. And she even threatened to resign from the NAACP board because she was um, she had been embarrassed in her capacity as a member of the United Nations Economic and Social Council um, by the information that was in the petition. So in other words, she was embarrassed that the US was put on blast in the United Nations. Um, and so again, the appeal, the US delegation made sure that the appeal wasn't given serious consideration. With regard to We Charge Genocide in 1952, 56 United States senators galvanized, uh, they, they organized to, um, they proposed something called the Bricker Amendment, which will prevent the US Constitution from being overridden by international treaties and executive agreements. So in other words, Congress passed, um, they passed a sort of act so that the United Nations could not override any of the US policies towards black people. And this was in direct response to the petition. Not only that, William Patterson's passport was canceled because he circulated the petition um, and of course, Paul Robeson's passport had already been, uh, Paul Robeson was involved in the preparation and circulation of, of We Charged in the Side. His passport had already been um, um, suspended because of his work that he was doing around human rights and workers' rights. Um, so through the organization of African-American uh, unity, Malcolm X both built upon and exceeded these efforts um, of the NNC, the NAACP and the CRC. Um, he sought to demand international sanctions from the United States, from the United Nations against the U.S. for refusing to recognize that um, the human rights of of the oppressed nation of African Americans. But he also understood that um, oppressed people themselves needed to organize against uh, what was happening, and that basically um, petitioning the United Nations was one step in cultivating a radical political struggle among 
uh, the oppressed and the racialized of the world. And so at the second organization of African-American Unity Rally on July 5th, 1964, Malcolm X made the following statement about human rights, um, quote, we have to make the world see that the problem that we've confronted with, that the problem that we're confronted with is a problem for humanity. It's not a Negro problem, it's not an American problem. Um, you and I have to make it a world problem, make the world aware that there will be no peace on this earth as long as our human rights are being violated in America. Then the world will have to step in and try to see that our human rights are respected and recognized. We have to create a situation that will explode this world sky high unless we are heard from when we ask for some kind of recognition and respect as human beings. This is all we want, to be human beings. If we can't be recognized and respected as a human being, we have to create a situation where no human being will enjoy life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. If you're not for that, you're not for freedom. It means you don't even want to be a human being. You don't want to pay the price that is necessary." End quote. So here we see that uh, Malcolm X is essentially throwing down the gauntlet that human rights is literally a matter of life and death. It is a matter of peace and further destruction. And um, as Fred Hampson says, it's peace only if you're willing to fight for it, right? And so um, I'm reaching the end of my time, but I just wanna speak a little bit about the people-centered human rights framework that Ajamu Baraka has been um, cultivating, thinking with people like Malcolm X and William Patterson and W.B. Du Bois and Paul Robeson and Claudia Jones and many, many others who stood the intimate, who understood the intimate connection between racialized violence, U.S. imperialism and, and Euro-American imperialism, war and the inability of human flourishing to exist under these conditions. And so he writes that people-centered uh, people -centered human rights are those non-oppressive rights that reflect the highest commitment to universal human dignity and social justice um, that individuals and collectives define and secure for themselves through social struggle. So in other words, human rights are not defined from the top down, they're defined from the bottom up. He says that they emanate from the black radical tradition. Um, they see human rights as an arena of struggle. So th this struggle is ongoing. They're informed by the needs of the oppressed. They're part of a strategy for decolonization and radical social change. Um, they specifically name the enemies of freedom, which is the Western white supremacist colonial capitalist patriarchy. Um, and they include, so human rights is not this sort of lofty abstract thing. Human rights is safe and accessible food, clean water, free quality education, healthcare and healthiness for all, um, adequate housing, public transportation, wages and a socially productive job that allows for a dignified life, ending mass incarceration, universal uh, child care, opposition to war, right? And um, an eradication of, of the destruction of the environment, police abolition, right? And self-determination and things that are gonna lead to the respect um, for democracy in all aspects of life. And so this is what human rights is. And we get the best understanding of human rights when we look at those who are the most oppressed or the most downtrodden. And for those of us who work from Marxist framework who create the most value, who create the actual value um, in this world and therefore who should have control over the material conditions of their lives and therefore should have um, should live a life of human flourishing. So, uh, so I'll stop there. So the first question is from one of our audience members um, and it's a little long, so maybe um, we'll need a, a reframing, but um, let me know uh, what you all think. Well, what do we know about the ability or power of the United States or any international group that received the appeals to actually be able to intervene or hold the United States accountable? Were they compromised in any way through the international influence of the United States, economic or otherwise? And then in parentheses, beyond any laws or restrictions passed internally by the United States Congress. And I believe that this is in reference to Malcolm uh, imploring the Afro, the Organization for African Unity to um, charge the United States for crimes against humanity. Yeah, so every, all, all from you know the National Negro Congress petition to um, you know Malcolm X and the Organization of African American Unity, they realize that that the UN is not an enforcement body. They don't have actual power to supersede like the sovereignty of particular nations. But um, again, the United States that did not you know stop the United States from passing this this. Um, you know, this act in Congress that said that 
meant to reaffirm that the United Nations could not could not supersede any sort of laws of, of the US. And so even as they even as folks understood that the UN cannot cannot necessarily enforce uh, any policy, it's it's still it's more than even a symbolic victory. It's sort of like a consciousness raising that the United States cannot um, engage in genocide or it cannot sort of marginalize and oppress the racialized people and in fact the overwhelming majority of the country with impunity and not only this that passing resolutions in the united nations shows solidarity right it shows the ways in which other countries who are full of you know racialized marginalized oppressed and formerly colonized people are not going to stand for this form of domination and repression from the united states and so it's more of a show of solidarity and it's also um, filing, file, not only filing, but circulating these petitions is also a form of consciousness raising both in the United States and beyond to, to just sheerly um, show to the world what's actually going on, but to also raise the consciousness of people to organize and to struggle on the ground against these forms of repression and domination that are happening. And also so that people throughout the world can link up the forms of the um, the sort of resonant forms of oppression that are happening throughout, right? Because U.S. imperialism looks a particular way in within the context of the United States, but then there's also like a massive U.S. based apparatus throughout the world. For example, there is U the United States as a state, but then there's also U.S. led corporations that are implementing all of these forms of repression and domination in various ways um, throughout the world, and so even if the United States can't, or excuse me, even if the United Nations can't enforce um, any sort of policy change in the United States, even though those sort of sanctions and those that calling out actually really matters. It's the same as if the organization of American states um, issued a, you know, a sanction against the United States um, for the murders, the ongoing police murder, police occupation, and police brutality in this, in this country. Because the United States issues, the United States actually has like monetary sanctions and actual, you know, actual blockades. But the, you, you know, so for example, the U.S. just tried to um, illegitimize the Venezuelan elections, right? And like this matters, this discourse and this aggression matters. And so if that is then, if there is a, if that is, turned on the United States so it knows that it is not above impunity, I think that that actually matters a lot. Another question that we have, um, and, and some of this was sort of touched on in, in, in the remarks made earlier, but in what ways have your understanding, um, has your understanding of human rights evolved, specifically during Trump's time in office? And in what ways do you predict movement work and conversation around human rights uh, to shift under a Biden and Harris presidency, if at all? I, I have never been one to use the framework of human rights because of the way that it is overdetermined by a sort of liberal individualist um, or even sort of um, kind of legalistic um, both approach as well as understanding and also the ways in which human rights has been used as a bludgeon for the global south. Like if you look, for example, at the International Criminal Court, I believe it is all African leader. It is only African leaders in Slobodan Milosevic, an Eastern European. So hearkening back to the anti-communism, anti-socialism that have been taken before the International Criminal Court. So when we talk about human when we talk about human rights and we talk about violations of human rights, it is used in a very sort of imperialistic and racist manner. Moreover, we talk about humanitarianism. It is grossly unhumanitarian. It is in the form of aid that leads to food insecurity throughout the world. It is in, in the form of aid, military aid that is meant to um, turn the state against its population to defend corporate and imperial interests. Um, it is in the service of um, hypocritically um, pointing to either gender or sexuality issues in other nations to rationalize invasion. And I think that that is, that is the dominant way in which human rights has been deployed and employed. And so um, even as we're thinking about, if we think with Ajambo Baraka and others who have been develop developing this people-centered human rights framework, um, 
if it is that we can get, if we can reposition that as the, the means of thinking about human rights, I think it's a useful terminology, but we cannot, we are, you know, we can just talk about straight up liberation. We could just talk about straight up revolution. Like we don't need to, you know, to put a fucking tuxedo on it. So um, I, I just, I really, um, and, you know, as, as uh, my comrades have spoken about very, very eloquently, a change, I love this term of the, a change in the tenant of the White House is superfluous. It does not matter, right? And so there's no change in terms of how we think about human flourishing from a, uh, from an, a Bush one to a Clinton <laughs> to an Obama to or a Bush two, I guess Bush two, then Obama, then Trump, then Biden. It's, it's one long continuation of corporatocracy, of oligopoly, and of warmongering um, capitalist imposition. And so um, I think it would behoove us to not, to think about regime change here simply as how much can we stop the bleeding or hold the line? But, but that has no bearing on the type of work that we need to do on the ground because our, our structural material conditions continue to be deplorable. Um, you know, the U.S. continues to be a war machine and pass, you know, that has no problem, for example, passing a defense budget in the hundreds of billions, but can't, but then, you know, can't even pack, come to a consensus over 600 raggedy ass dollars for ordinary people, which is, gonna, which is going to do nothing. And so I, I really think that uh, we need to stop looking at the top. <laughs> and start looking around at each other and really think about and not be reactive and just really, um, again, as my comrades have been saying, continue movement building, continue organizing. And for petty bourgeois Negroes such as myself, like what, you know, not be part of the fucking problem and not try to engage in this intersectional imperialism and this woke, you know, this woke neoliberalism and um, do our job, which is to redistribute resources um, and wealth. So. Fidel Castro said like revolutionaries are always optimistic. And I just really believe that. And also like chaos, I, you know, so a lot of the, okay. I'm, I'm like ovaries deep in the 1930s right now because I feel like there's so much that was happening in the 1930s. And I'm also like writing this book, but like there's so much that was happening in the 1930s that resonates with now like the rise of fascism and the ways in which popular fronts coalesce, right? The anti-colonial and anti-fascist fronts coalesced in that moment. Um, as Claudia mentioned, like the people that went and fought in Spain, the people that were struggling on behalf of the evasion of Abyssinia by the Italians, um, and of the worker strikes, all of the sort of, all of the energy that was around defeating fascism and, um, you know, and identifying in imperialism and colonialism as basically the close cousins, as George Padmore and CLR James said, of fascism. And so I think that to me, I'm more concerned about the people who are not miserable and who are well adjusted to this deeply inhuman, deeply destructive society in which we live. And so, to me, like, so I'm an academic and the academy is odious. It is the intellectual arm of the state writ large. And I'm always uncomfortable. I am always mad as hell. And I have tell myself the minute that I feel well-adjusted in this shit, like, come get me, it's a clone, send help, right? Because like, I want to be, I want to feel like an outsider within, in that space because I want to be in it, but not of it. And so all of that to say, I think that that, that it's a, dis, dis, a productive discomfort and a sort of a productive ill ease that we have, because that means that we know like there's something better to come, right? If, we'll, if we will struggle for it, if we'll organize for it. I do think we have never faced anything like this ever um, because of the um, the, you know, whether you call it superstructure or whatever, but we have so much social media. We're in the golden age of television, meaning that there's so much distraction. There's so, there's so much that, that allows us to not, to, to continue to negotiate the terms of our immiseration and to think that we're, we're doing far better than we actually are. And to think that, you know, to identify with the ruling class, because it's like, if we just work hard enough, or if we just hit it big or you know get our angles right on Instagram that we too can join the elite right and it's it's complete 
a bullshit, right? Because the reason why the rich are very rich is because most of us don't have anything. And so I think that it's important um, for us to continue to raise consciousness and to fight the anti-communism and anti-radicalism. So my work is thinking about the linkages between anti-blackness and anti-radicalism precisely because um, the anti-radicalism colonizes the imagination, right? It colonizes or it, it, it crushes freedom dreams so that our, our horizon of possibility is like Keynesianism, right? It's fucking embedded liberalism. It's social, you know, this social democratic shit, right? That is really just a band-aid on a very, on a, a gaping wound as everybody's using the, you know, using that analogy. So um, to make a short story long as I do, I think that um, the world collapsing or the, you know, the decline of US imperialism, the collapse of US imperialism is something to be joyful about. It's, it's painful and it's hard, but yay shit like we had like we our time is well past our prime and I think that that's something that is not something to you know that's something to organize around but it's not something to be to lament about because um we deserve better 